let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. I realized this week that um, I have one new experience this week that I haven't had in other uh, institutes or defending the faith, and that is I have a bad cold. <laughs> I have not appreciated how healthy I have been in the past. So I apologize for um, my voice, and I will do the best I can not to cough and sneeze too much in this area <laughs> and, make, and make other people ill. I think the uh, conversation uh, around the leadership table went something like this. Okay, we're going to do Ephesians, and um, who wants to do Ephesians 1, you know, and someone volunteered Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3, and we get to Ephesians 5, it says, I'm not going to do Ephesians 5, you do Ephesians, no, I'm not, you know, let's give it to Kimberly. <laughs> I'm actually teasing, but it is a real privilege and challenge to teach on Ephesians 5, and I hope that the Lord will help me to communicate some of what is really beautiful and challenging uh, that we need to apply in this chapter. So if you would turn to Ephesians 5, let me just add one small, small quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these minutes together. We ask, oh God, that you would inspire our hearts with a larger vision than we have had for the sacrament of marriage and that you would help us to know ways in which we can support marriages around us. And for those of us who are married, that we would embrace more deeply what this call is. In your name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to start with the first verse of Ephesians. Um, and what I want to talk about, first of all, is how are we supposed to walk? And then how are we supposed to dance? All right? And we're going to start with walking. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. We're to imitate, all of us, we are to imitate God as beloved children. We're to walk in love, and that means that we are to conform our thoughts, our words, and our actions to Christ. He unpacks this a little bit. In verse 3, but fornication and all impurity and or covetousness must not be named among you as is fitting among th the saints. Let there be no filthiness or silly talk or levity, which is not fitting, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Okay. And then go on down to verse 9. Actually, verse 8. For once you were in darkness, but now you're in light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So before Christ, we walk in darkness, but in Christ, we walk in light. And then look on in verse 10, try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That's going to take us a lifetime to figure out all of the ways in which we can please the Lord. Because it's not just about avoiding committing sins, it's also finding out all the ways in which uh, we still need to learn to express love and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and living out that fruit of the Spirit. This is lifelong, but we have a life to do it. Verse 11, take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So there's a task not only in not committing deeds of darkness, but also in the appropriate ways and times, exposing it to the light. So there are many ways, many elements in which we need to think through each day of our Christian life. Lord, am I, how am I walking? Am I walking as a child of light? Am I walking as a beloved child? Am I imitating you in this conversation? Am I imitating you in these actions? And even, am I imitating you in my thought life? You know, are we inviting Christ to be the Lord of our imagination? especially when we're viewing things on the internet. Look at verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise men, 
but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Isn't that interesting? The days were evil in St. Paul's age, and we could certainly say the same today. We need to be wise. We referred to Ephesians 4.29 yesterday. Let no evil come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for edifying, as fits the occasion, that it may impart grace to all who hear. I mean, I think that's a verse I could read every morning and have it change the way I talk. Because it's not about not offending the other person. It's a lot deeper than that. Are my words going to be life-giving? Are my words going to impart grace? And somehow or another, our words can do that. And so, Lord, give me the, give me the awareness that I have that privilege to be able to impart grace, to edify, and it needs to be fitting. Okay? And in verse 16, we don't want to be frivolous with time. The, the numbers of our days are set, according to Psalm 139. God knows all of them. So the question is, if I do good, is not, if I do good things, will I get more time? It's, what am I going to do with the time that I have? I was just thrilled. I talked to one man who's a presenter of um, Genesis to Jesus, and he's been going up to a retirement center giving Bible studies to women in their 80s and 90s. And there's like this cracker shot 98-year-old who's just so excited every single week <laughs> of the things that she's learning. We can learn. We can grow. There is no time limit apart as long as we've got a day on this earth, we can become more and more of a child of light, walking in light instead of darkness, growing in wisdom and living it out. Verse 17, therefore don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I, I really would love to <laughs> go into more detail about these next verses, but um, we'll, just, we'll just read them and, and take them to heart. You know, as Catholics, we can sing. We can, and we should. This is not a, a non-Catholic thing to, um, to sing vigorously at Mass. I, I think if we took this seriously, you know, addressing each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody to the Lord, if we really come and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the Eucharist, shouldn't that make us sing? I, I had one person say, well, you know, we don't have to have great sermons or great songs because we've got the Eucharist. And I wanted to say, because we have the Eucharist, we should be having dynamic singing and awesome homilies and everything should be to the praise and glory of God. You agree? <laughs> okay. Um, and then verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, it's okay to be under the influence. It's just what are you under the influence of? to be under the influence of the Spirit. And the key, I think, is verse 20. Always and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. Thanksgiving. Now, all of these elements apply to marriage. God, I don't think that St. Paul just breaks off from here and begins to talk about marriage. I think he's already talking about marriage, but now he's going to get a little more nitty-gritty and specific. All right? How to dance. Someone's got to follow. Look in verse 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. The dance of the husband and wife is grounded in their mutual submission and reverence for Christ. But we can't just do an end rounded and say wives are to be submissive to husbands and husbands just as submissive to wives any more than we would use the following example in verse 23, and say that the church is to be just as submissive to Christ as Christ is submissive to the church, or vice versa. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. In other words, the model is that Christ leads the church in this beautiful nuptial dance, and a husband is to lead a wife, both in subjection to Christ but then there is an order of authority. And that applies as long as a husband does not ask a wife to not be obedient to Christ. In other words, it's always obedience to Christ and then flowing from that obedience to a husband. 
Now, the great thing is that this is not a kind of obedience that is talked about of children to parents or servants to masters. There's actually a different Greek word used. This one is hupotasso. It's used in sort of a military context where there is an order of authority. And the kind of word for obedience that's used is hupakuo, which is used in chapter 6, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 5. So there is a difference here. We're not talking about a, a childish kind of thing where a, a husband is supposed to parent his wife. Not at all. But there is leadership, real leadership, to be offered. And again, it's in imitation of Christ and his church. Now, just in case someone didn't quite get it, in verse 24, Paul states it again. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject in all things, in everything, to their husbands. Submission is something freely given. It is not coerced. This is not degrading. This allows for no abuse whatsoever. And it's very important when we're talking about something that's this sensitive, especially in our time and culture, that we want to be very clear. It is service-oriented, but it is not servile, demeaning, or dominating ever. A husband is to be motivated by the fruit of the Spirit, which includes gentleness. And we read yesterday in Ephesians 3.19 that husbands are not to be harsh with their wives. So this has nothing to do with, you know, coming home and demanding your, your pipe and slippers and ordering around a wife. This has to do with leadership as to the Lord, as to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says the head of every wife is her husband. And notice it doesn't say her Christian husband. Now, it gets tricky because it's always important that a wife who is married to a non-Christian has to always obey the Lord first. But she is to follow her husband's lead as far as she can. So if a husband would say, you cannot go to Mass or you cannot take the children to Mass, that could not be obeyed because you have to obey God rather than man. But we know a circumstance in which a wife came to her husband and she said, I really think that God wants me to be involved in youth work. They had two little children. And he said, you don't have the time to do that. No. And she said, well, God has called me, so I need to obey him. So she set off, leaving her children at home, got involved in the youth group. Things were rough at home for a variety of reasons, I'm sure, at least one of which was her directly defying him by doing what she thought she wanted to do. And so she poured out her heart to this young man who also worked with the youth group. And we spoke to him a few months into it where his heart had completely fallen for this woman. She ended up leaving her husband because she formed this deep spiritual bond with the co-leader and, you know, how rough it was at home. And now, as leaders of the youth group, she was leaving her husband in the midst of an affair and they were, you know, this youth leader was going to go off and marry her. And I, I mean, he asked me my opinion, <laughs> a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> and I said, this is from the pit of hell. I mean, you need to repent. She needs to repent. You need to do it not in person. You need to go through the priest. Uh, she needs to go back and ask her husband for forgiveness. And if the, if the youth group is aware of what you've done, you need to ask their forgiveness and you need to step away from ministry. Now, all of that didn't occur just because she defied her husband, but unless there is a clear directive from the Lord, even a non-Christian husband is to be followed. Okay, how to dance. Someone's got to take the lead. I don't know if you've ever been at a four-way stop, and my husband calls it a Christian traffic jam, where everybody's going, well, you go first, you go first, you go first. And it's like, somebody go first. <laughs> You're going to be there all day. Well, someone's got to lead. Look at verse 23. As we read, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Christ leads the church. But how does he lead? 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water 
with the word, that he might present the church to him in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Okay? This is sacrificial servant love. This is not lorded over the authority kind of leadership. This is sacrificial servant leadership. The question, gentlemen, is are you willing to die? And, and maybe the harder question, are you willing to change a dirty diaper? <laughs> I often think that, you know, a lot of men can be stirred in their hearts to think that they would defend their family to the death, but do a carpool, help with the dishes, you know? There are lots and lots of little ways in which husbands are called to sacrifice, to lay down their lives in servant love with their wives. Um, a friend of mine here in town had uh, overheard an interesting conversation when his daughter was playing with a little boy next door. I guess they had decided to uh, play pirate ship or something. And, um, and so the little boy said, um, I'm going to be the captain. And then she announced, I'll be the captain. And he said, no, no, I will be the captain. And there was this dramatic pause. And then she said, okay, you be the captain. I'll be the captain's mother. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this loud protestation, no! <laughs> he knows what we know, and that is, captains have power, but mothers of captains outrank them. <laughs> and she was pulling rank. The question in marriage is not, who's got the power? Okay? It's, how am I called to serve? How am I called to serve? Because leadership is service in love. Think for a moment about the Trinity. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are all equally God. Okay? No one of them is more God than the other. And yet they function in a particular way. The Father sends the Son. And how many times does Jesus say, I only do the things that my Father does. I only say the things my Father says. He makes it very clear that he's under the Father's authority. And then the Father and the Son send the Spirit. There is functional subordination without diminishing in importance or in their very nature each person of the Godhead. When we talk about male leadership in the home, we are not talking about men being more important. It is their role of service. Men and women, we know from Genesis 1, were both made in the image and likeness of God. Both men and women are fallen. Both men and women are in need of salvation. And in Christ, there is neither male nor female. We are both equally saved. It has nothing to do with whether or not we're equally important or equally persons. But within marriage, there is a functional subordination under Christ that does not diminish our dignity. The husband's authority is derivative from God. And the wife's authority as a mother especially, is derivative from the Lord and her husband. And then even within the family, according to birth order, there is a kind of authority where you raise up your firstborn as your point, point man or point woman, where they lead the way. The context is love and service to the Lord and each other. Now, blessed John Paul II emphasized another order within marriage, and that's the order of love. He was echoing a document written in 1930, Casti Canubi, quote, for if the man is the head, the woman is the heart, and as he occupies the chief place in ruling, so she may and ought to claim for herself the chief place of love. In the dance of marriage, husband is first in the order of authority as the head of the home, the wife is first in the order of love as the heart of the home. There is something that God has placed within us, and, and Blessed John Paul spoke about it in a variety of ways. Um, there is something very unique that women have, a, a gift of nurturing, and there's a way in which we tune into relationships often within family. Our thoughts and our intuitions strengthen our husband, 
and his leadership. And a wise husband will draw on that. As a wife, I receive the gift of Scott's love, and I respond in love. And I think it's important that we understand this is a very active participation in obedience. It's not a passivity. It's not a, okay, I'll be the doormat, just run over me and do whatever you want. Think about Mary. She's very receptive, but she's not passive. In fact, I love this example. You know, the angel comes to her first to announce the Annunciation. But then the angel, after coming to Joseph and clarifying things so that he properly takes her as his wife, as protector of the Holy Family, who does the angel come to to say it's time to flee to Egypt? He, it, he comes to Joseph, and I think that's part of Mary's humility that she doesn't say, hey, I'm the one that he comes to. I'm the one that gets the game plan. You didn't run that by me first. He says, we're going to flee to Egypt, and she begins to pack. Okay, there's a beautiful example there of her humility in responding to the leadership of St. Joseph. These are complementary, not competitive roles. It isn't a question of which one is more important, the head or the heart. What can you live without? When a couple respects the order of authority and the order of love, peace prevails peace prevails. Now, there are difficulties. For women, you can be afraid that he may not lead you faithfully in following Christ, especially if he's not a Christian. And it is a risk trusting him to lead, especially when it isn't what you want to do. For men, it's, there are fears of, if I say this is what we're going to do, will she follow me? Um, especially, it might be a risk doing the leadership at all, and she seems like such a strong leader, maybe I'll just sit back and, and let her do it. But what will bring the greatest peace in your family will be following the correct order. We had been married about three weeks, and I remember sitting down um, on a Saturday across the table from Scott, and I said, okay, how are you going to lead me? <laughs> he said, we've only been married three weeks, give me time. <laughs> And he's a strong leader. So, ladies, don't get discouraged if your husband is learning how to lead you. But sometimes you got to step back to give him some space to do it. Um, now, one thing I want to clarify is that the order of authority is not a consequence of the curse. The struggle with the order of authority is a consequence of the, of the curse. Consider what Adam did. First of all, God created him first. And it is from him that he created Eve. One of Adam's tasks was to name the animals, and that was a way in which he exercised authority over all of the animals. When Eve is created, he names her. He names her, and that's an expression of his leadership. When the serpent comes, and we don't have time to go into a lot of detail about it, but when the serpent comes, he addresses Eve in the you plural. You don't get that it, apart from understanding Hebrew. But he's addressing both of them, which means Adam's there. And Adam should have led his wife away from temptation, but he is silent. And so husbands, I think that's a caution that it's not enough to say, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing, so I'll say nothing. You've got to, you've got to speak. Eve not only fell in temptation, but then what does she turn around and do? She becomes a temptress. She leads her husband, and Adam should not have followed her into sin, but he does. After the struggle, excuse me, after the fall, we have a clear picture of the struggle. As part of the curse that um, our Lord begins to itemize, um, when he's speaking to Eve, he says in 316, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Her desire is going to be disordered. It's going to be to dominate her husband rather than to follow his leadership. And yet, he will lead, but his temptation is going to be to dominate, to control, rather than to lead in love. Or as um, 
uh, our Lord refers to the kind of Gentile leadership as lording authority, like the Gentiles do. And that's not what we're to be doing. Now, leading in love is not meaning peace at any price. And I just have to throw this in there because we just had our third child get married, and, and I don't know why this saying seems to be prevailing wisdom, but I don't agree with it at all. It's um, happy wife, happy life. Do whatever it takes to get your wife happy because if you, if you have a happy wife, then there won't be any problems at home. And I think you could end up with a spoiled brat of a wife. I don't agree with that at all. I think it should be holy wife, happy life. The call is not to do whatever you can to placate your wife. You are to call her on in holiness and set an example. Likewise for wives, it's not do whatever it takes to keep him from blowing his cool. No, he is to have self-control all by himself. Okay? We are to call each other on in holiness. And in fact, in those cases in which a man will not lead spiritually in the family, Cassidy Kanubi says this, in fact, if the husband neglect his duty, it falls to the wife to take his place in directing the family. I don't think that means that the church doesn't care whether or not we marry committed Catholics because the wife can always do the spiritual leadership. I think we need to have sons raised who assume spiritual leadership in their home and we need to, to let people know this is the norm. But when it is not the situation in your family, it is incumbent upon the wife to at least spiritually lead the family if, it, if otherwise it won't happen. Now we, we had an interesting experience. Our first year of marriage, we went to three different weddings. And in the weddings, we read this, this passage and we'd be sitting next to each other and just kind of reliving uh, how wonderful it was to be married and you know seeing this couple committed. And we would end up out in the parking lot and the conversation would unravel something like this. It would be so much easier to lead you if you would follow. <laughs> or, if you just love me like Christ loves the church, it would be so much easier to follow you. And I, I'm not kidding you, all three times we almost didn't go into the reception. We were in such a pitched battle in argument. And I have no doubt that that was the evil one, you know, planting his little seeds of nastiness. But we gave full consent, you know. And after it happened the third time, we're like, hold on, hold on. We have been here before, twice. What is going on? And we realize St. Paul does not say, wives, make sure your husbands love you like Christ loves the church. Or, husbands, make sure your wives submit to you. If we focus on the part that's clear that we are supposed to do, we open the heart of our spouse to do what he or she is supposed to do. And there's a reason why he doesn't say, husbands and wives set each other straight, okay? So, I, and we've done better since then, you know, <laughs> not, not arguing uh, after, after weddings. Now, there, this is more than a dance of romance, okay? This is nitty-gritty, practical, challenging life. Look at verse 28. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Husbands, you are to love your wives like your very own physical body. And Christ is your model. Think of the ways in which he cherishes the church and he nourishes the church. Now, the gift of our bodies is something I want to focus on for a minute. If you look at first, you can keep your finger in Ephesians 5 because we'll come back to it. But uh, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 6. As my husband says, uh, sexual intercourse is one of the things we do in marriage that is probably the most godlike thing that we do. That possibility of there being the creation of new life. And I think that's why there's so many important teachings about the body. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And this is after St. Paul has um, taught that even a prostitute who only intends to, um, you know, to make a buck 
actually still becomes one with the person that she's having intercourse with. In verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And in marriage, what does that mean? Just look over one chapter, chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. Well, maybe a few more, starting in 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not rule over his own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not rule over his own body, but the wife does. In other words, when you say in the covenant of marriage, I am yours and you are mine, you are giving up your rights to your body to that other person. You are, you are giving each other, yourself as a gift and receiving the other as a gift. Do not refuse one another except perhaps for, by agreement for a season that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again lest Satan tempt you through lack of self-control. This is actually the biblical basis, among other things, for natural family planning. That when in prayer you sense this is a time in which um, during times of mutual fertility you're not to be... Uh, engaging in sexual intercourse, that during that time you abstain, but then you come back together so that Satan doesn't get a foothold. But this is important that we love one another and love each other physically. I remember talking at a conference in St. Louis, and I, I must have really hit a nerve because I was making some comparisons, as I will at the end, between the Eucharist and um, the act of marriage. And I said, um, frequent communion is is very good. And I just kind of left it hanging, and this woman came up to me, she goes, I know what you were saying. And I said, do you? And she said, I told my husband once a month is fine, and he should be okay with that. I don't think husbands or wives should announce to each other what the correct frequency of sexual intimacy should be, and I will certainly not go into any detail with you. But I think a couple needs to know that there is a way in which the marital bond is deepened through that intimacy, through the vulnerability of the act of marriage. And it is not just to make a baby. It is to deepen our bond. It is to um, care for each other. And that it's a real ministry within marriage that helps limit the temptations that the evil one brings. One of the ways Scott refers to it, which I think is so helpful, is to think, you know, if, if your bedroom is the Holy of Holies within your home, it's like the priest coming and entering the Holy of Holies. And God does beautiful, holy things in something that is a, more than just the physical act of marriage. There is a way in which we are responding to grace and being a channel of grace to each other. And... And the two becoming one is so real that nine months later, you might have to give it a name. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? I want to talk about the sacramentality of marriage. Look at verses 31 to 33, <clears throat> back in Ephesians 5. Just take a moment to get there myself. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is a profound one, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This passage of Genesis 2.24 draws us back to the beginning. You know, marriage is the primordial sacrament of the Old Testament, and when our daughter got married in May, it was so beautiful to hear it read again, that it's, it's the one um, uh, institution that wasn't destroyed by the fall, and it wasn't washed away in the flood. As Blessed John Paul said, marriage is the most ancient revelation of the plan of the created world. And at the wedding, a new family is formed. It's not a baby that makes it a new family. It's that couple. Um, again, back in Genesis 1.28, after God creates man and woman in his image, he consecrates them. He blesses them with a command. 
uh, and he, um, let's see, I could go by memory, but I better not. <laughs> well, maybe I can. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. One flesh union of a husband and wife reveals the life-giving power of love. And it's a unique way in which we reflect the Trinity, the triune God who didn't create us because he was bored, he didn't have anything else to do, I wonder what, you know. It's because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit constitute this communion of life-giving lovers and life-loving givers. And they called us into creation to empower us to reflect, image, him. And so in imitation of Christ, we've been called to be living sacrifices. Now, I want to refer you back to another passage by St. Paul, which is Romans 12. This is probably, I would refer to it as my life verse. And we'll see how much I can unpack quickly, because I have more I want to share. Revelation, excuse me, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And I, I want to pause there, and then I want to do verse 2. First of all, St. Paul is appealing to us by the mercy of God. When we talk about these things, when we talk about male leadership and woman being the uh, first in the order of love and the dance of marriage and the possibility of life-giving love, we are talking about amazing things that for us to do well, we can't do it in our own strength and power. But what Paul clarifies here is we aren't asked to. God has grace for us to live according to his design and purpose. And that involves us presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. As one of my friends said, you know, the trouble with living sacrifices is we aren't dead yet. <laughs> and so we say to God, I want to give you myself, you know, and we crawl up on the altar in our minds, you know, at mass. We're like, here I, here I am, Lord. And then it begins to hurt. <laughs> And so we start crawling off the altar, like, I don't think I really meant that. And he's like, come on back on the altar. You really did, you know, come. I, I want to give you the strength that you need to do this. It is hard to be a living sacrifice, okay? I think of that in terms of pregnancy. You know, I, I would say, Lord, I really want to be pregnant. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And then I would get nauseous. And then I would get all these you know, stretch marks, and I had all C-sections, and, you know, there's so much involuntary sacrifice to a pregnancy, and yet what a beautiful expression of spiritual worship. This is the physical part of our spiritually worshiping the Lord day in and day out by presenting our bodies as a sacrifice, and this is something beautiful and acceptable to him. Now look at verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are bombarded by false images, false thoughts about what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a consecrated person, what it is to be a married person, the value of marriage, the purpose of marriage, the value of a child. We are bombarded by falsehood. But how will we know if it's false? We, we just get so immersed in our own culture. How do we know? We need to have our minds transformed. We need our minds renewed. Part of why you're here this week is, Lord, I want to think thoughts beyond my own. Open the scriptures to me. Part of why we go to Mass is that the Spirit will work in our hearts. Part of why we go to confession is to clear away the clutter so we can think more clearly Christ's thoughts after him. We need our minds renewed, transformed, so that we view our spouse the way God wants us to view our spouse, so that we view our children in the gift of life the way he views that, so that we view our singleness 
and embrace the gift, whether it's temporary or permanent, to live to the praise of his glory where we are so that we can prove the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We don't have to be conformed to this world. We can be transformed. You know, the world would say, if you're not using contraception, you're probably not a thinking person. Seriously. I mean, in my own family, I, it's dismissive. It's, it's, I mean, I'm talking about my extended family, parents and siblings. It's just kind of stupid. Like, why wouldn't you do something like that? Now, my family did, doesn't fall into this category, but there are a lot of people who do where they would say abortion is just th what you do when contraception fails. And sterilization is when you have the beautiful all-American family that you want to keep. But the church teaches every act of marriage is to be open to life and that it is serious sin, mortal sin, to use contraception to commit an abortion to be sterilized? Do we know why? Do we understand this? Are we living in conformity to it? The world presumes marriage is really not that important. If two people love each other, they should just live together. That way they are free to end it and move on to another relationship without all the difficulty of getting divorced and remarried. But the church teaches that the act of marriage is exactly that. It is supposed to take place within marriage. And cohabitation is just a nice-sounding term for fornication. You can't practice a sacrament. When people say, I'm so glad we live together because now we know it doesn't work. It's like, marriage wouldn't work? You haven't even tried it. And is marriage something you try? How do we think? Do we think with the mind of Christ? Do we think with the mind of the church? St. Paul says that this is a mystery in Ephesians. This is a mystery. And the Greek word mysterion, which was mentioned on the first night, the Latin translation of that is sacramentum. Marriage in Christ is elevated to the level of a sacrament so that our marriage is an earthly image of the heavenly vision between Christ and the church. Part of our witness, part of our testimony for those of us who are married is the very fact of our, of our marriage. We're a living sign to the world of Christ's love for the church. And will Christ ever abandon his spouse? No. And likewise, we are not to abandon ours. Loving partnerships, spouses with equal dignity, this is something that our world is desperate to see, to know. Marriage is much farther reaching than just two people who are in love because God is the author of marriage. And so he is committed to providentially overseeing our marriages and families, according to Ephesians 3.15. He wants to be intimately involved in building our marriages and families into civilizations of love. According to a Vatican II document, quote, the intimate union of marriage as a mutual giving of two persons and the good of the children demand total fidelity from the spouses and require an unbreakable unity between them. Having it be a sacrament doesn't make it easy, okay? It just makes it possible. Scott and I had this conversation I, in the last couple of years, and I, he's, I, I won't say it as well as he said it, but it was something like this. We don't get added sacramental grace for marriage, or a priest doesn't get added sacramental grace for his office because we're specially chosen as much as we are specially needy. That it is so far beyond what we can do in our own strength and power that God gives us unique additional graces for that. As the Catechism says, the grace of the sacrament thus perfects the human love of the spouses, strengthens their indissoluble bond, excuse me, unity, <clears throat> excuse me, and sa sanctifies them on the way to eternal life. This life is not all there is. We are here to get out of here. We are here to become 
saints. And if you are married, your spouse is an intimate part of that journey toward heaven. Now, there are two sacraments of intimate union and holy communion. And I want to very quickly go through seven comparisons. I could go into more detail at another time, but I, I know you'll, you'll catch, um, you'll, you'll make all kinds of connections as you think about this. There are two, int- two sacraments, and they are holy matrimony and holy Eucharist. And here's just seven ways that they do something very powerful and very similar. Both express holy communion through the total gift of self. In both person, excuse me, in both, two persons are united. Both sacraments create a family bond of love. Both sacraments demonstrate the sacrificial nature of love. The Catechism in 1642 says Christ dwells with them, speaking of a married couple, gives them strength to take up their crosses and so follow him to rise again after they have fallen, to forgive one another, to bear one another's burdens, to be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, and to love one another with supernatural, tender, and fruitful love. This is what he does for the church in feeding us with the Eucharist as the bridegroom of our soul, and this is what, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he does in our marriages. Fifth, both sacraments are gifts for which we need to give thanks. Do you thank God every day for your spouse if you're married? Every day. That's echoed in so many of Paul's teachings. Um, I think of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, Pray constantly, uh, sorry, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You want to know the will of God? It's to give thanks. And sometimes that is a sacrifice of praise, maybe for your spouse, maybe for a particular child. But we do know that's, that's part of the will of God, is that we are to thank him in all circumstances. Number six, both sacraments are only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit when she conceived Jesus. The Holy Spirit overshadows the bread and wine so that they become the body and blood of Christ. And the Catechism says in 1624, the Holy Spirit is the seal of their covenant, the ever-available source of their love and the strength to renew their fidelity. Number seven, both sacraments require us to trust in God's providence that he will provide what we need and be sustained by his grace. Now, marriage is work. It is work. We need help with conflict resolution so that we pull together instead of pull apart. I think there's a reason why St. Paul's longest discourse on marriage is in the chapter right before his, his longest teaching on spiritual warfare. I really do. Because if, if Satan can attack Christian marriage, and especially Catholic marriage that, that says this is an indissoluble bond, if he can attack there, he can weaken our witness. I remember watching Gabriel and Sarah when they knelt down to say their vows, and I just, I I could just visualize this huge bullseye on their backs, on their collective backs, you know, and I said, Lord, I have got to pray so much harder for them than ever before. Are we standing with each other? Are we praying for the marriages in our parishes, the marriages in our children, that our children have? I have the same sense with Michael and Anna, and now Ben and Hannah have married. It's so important, not only that we pray prayers of protection, but that we support them because it is a real way in which as they walk of children of light, they are making a foray into the darkness, and they will bring light. And as they are open to life, they are bringing, you know, new little ones who they bring to the church for baptism, who are the next generation of the church. It is possible for two persons to flourish in the interpersonal communion of love to which we have been called in marriage. We can be that witness. We need to be that witness for not just for our own sake, 
but for the sake of our church and especially our culture. And as St. Paul wrote in chapter 5, 1 and 2, may we imitate God as his beloved children, walking as children of light and dancing, leading and following as he has called us. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the practical wisdom that you give us. These are lofty high ideals we talk about, and yet there's such a nitty-gritty aspect to marriage and family life. Please help us, Lord. Give us insights to know today some new ways in which we can follow you more closely to truly walk as children of light, bringing light into the darkness. May we live to the praise of your glory as living sacrifices. Mary, we ask for your prayers, especially as you have led the way both for consecrated life and married life, and ask that you would pray for us, your beloved children. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.